Count down from five, okay? When I get to one, you have to make a decision. You can't give into peer pressure. It has to be just like automatic, okay? <laughs> There's so much fear in this room. Okay, all right, here's your choices. Choice number one, you get to keep your failures and your wisdoms. Number two, you can, you crumple up your failures and you chuck them in the recycling bin and you keep your wisdoms. Or you crumple up your wisdom and you chuck it and you keep your, you keep your failures. Or option four, is you crumple up both of them <laughs> and you chuck them both in, okay? There's your four choices. Is there any need for clarification before I count down? <laughs> you have to aim it for here. That's the goal. This is, this is where you throw them. Okay, you ready? Okay, you should all stand. This is, this is really good. Okay, all stand. And the kids at home can stand if they can, wherever they are. Okay. When I get to one, you just do it, whatever it is. Okay, you ready? Five, four, three, two, one, go. Uh -huh. <laughs> and we aren't in Mackey Arena. Okay, all right, <laughs> good job. Okay, all right, sit down. Okay, what choice did you make and why? Go ahead, let's hear it. What choice did you make and why? Okay, very profound. Okay, very good. Others, why, wh what choice did you make and why? I threw away my wisdom and kept my, <laughs> my failures. Why? That's not going to be funny. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it is kind of funny. <laughs> and maybe we'll come back to that. But <laughs> all right, so for humor's sake, we threw away wisdom and we kept failure. All right, there's a lesson there. Very good. Others, decisions. Why did we, what did you do? Okay, so over time, wisdom becomes more valuable than the failure itself, and therefore, I can get rid of my failure, I can keep my wisdom, okay? Other thoughts? Or does that pretty much sum up everybody else's thing? Okay, did anyone else keep both? You kept both, okay. All right, anyone else throw away failure? Okay, and no one else throw, you're the only one that threw away wisdom. Okay, all right. That's all right. So here's some quotes, inspiration from some really, really cool, inspiring people about failure. Uh, you can read them, but I will read them too. So uh, Bill Gates said, it's fine to celebrate success, but it is more important to heed the lessons of failure. Uh, Barack Obama, former president of the United States, said, you can't let your failures define you. You have to let your failures teach you. And then the great Maya Angelou said, you may encounter many defeats, but you must not be defeated. In fact, it may be necessary to encounter the defeats so you can know who you are, what you can rise from, and how you can still come out of it. We talked about being a baby. The next big stage you've developed, I mean, there's lots of stages of development, and I'm no, you know, you're gonna have to talk to my wife who majored in marriage and family to talk about this to you. But we, we, the next big stage is we are getting ready to walk. And boy, oh boy, this is quite the experience. We have a support group of parents who can take care of us with positive reinforcement. Uh, it's a crazy madhouse at our house when it's time for kids to walk. We're just, yes, you know, we're just so excited. Let's get going. There's lots of practice. Hopefully you've seen this. Hopefully, you, you know, if you have siblings or nieces, nephews, you've seen this. Lots of practice. We fail more than we succeed, okay? I think about my own children watching them do this. 
they are, there are so many bruises and tears and I don't know if I've had blood yet. I don't think so. Anyway, you fail so much, right, while you're doing this. And it's rapid reflection. It's, oh, did I do that wrong? Oh, did I do this? What did I do? Let me learn from that. Let me, right? So you have this whole kind of environment totally centered around learning how to walk. But it is filled with failure. Um, <clears throat> principle two is we learn from the repetition of failure and reflection and adaptation. We fail, we think about that failure, we change it up a little bit, and hopefully that becomes wisdom as we change it. As we keep going, we learn how to walk. And, you know, for, I can only speak for the people who are here, you walked here, right? You, you did it. You figured it out. But it was fraught with failure in the beginning for you. Um, so, you know, we all have reasons as to why we, you know, about our failures and our wisdom. But that experience that you wrote down, all these experiences of failures, ultimately build and help you become who you are. Uh, Maya Angelou's right. It helps you understand who you are, uh, what you can rise from. Like, wow, I can sign my name on a couple of pieces of paper, and I can lose a ton of money, and I can still eat. Can still, I can still move on. My life is not totally destroyed, right? Um, it's it's going to be OK. Um, and, and then you can also realize you know, what you, you know, other things that you can come out of. Um, so while we may not always appreciate our failures, and sometimes we even are over time are like, that's it. I'm done with these failures. We, we, can, we just don't let them define us anymore. Uh, we can get rid of them. But sometimes it's nice, like some of the other students here, to hold on to those failures and remember them for empathy's sake. When we see someone else fail, we see someone else go, oh, you, you signed on the dotted line and you didn't think about that, did you? Oh, I remember. And let me, let me put an arm around you. Let me, let me be a friend and let me help you. OK. All right, this is, this is where we come back to you. What questions, what comments or insights are you learning or thinking about, about failure and its role in learning? Maybe even in your own projects, what are you learning about failure and learning? Please. Any, any of the above, right? Failure in the experience of learning is whatever, yeah. Oh, yeah, you're just clarifying? Very nice. Yeah, obviously I failed to explain. So, uh, yeah, no, it's failure in the experience of learning, right? Um, yeah, please. Um, but this past week, I was actually able to find a different structural engineer to talk with. Um, and so hopefully we can use those lessons that we learned over the past like two years to actually get the structural drawings from this structural engineer who will have to hopefully have more time and ability to work on it. Yeah, great. And I'm still working on it myself. But, you know, not too long ago, I think in my life would have been like, wow, what a waste, right? Two years. Right? That's funding, that's all these things that go in it. What a waste. But now, and I'm not saying I'm like, you know, a guru about this, but I'm just saying like, now I'm starting to think about this a little different where I'm like, wait a minute, what if that was necessary? What if that's kind of a blessing? I think maybe one of you said a blessing in disguise, right, about failures. What, what if the two years is, was actually a gift? It didn't work for two years so that we, we didn't ruin it when we actually got further down the road, right? I don't know. That's kind of where I, I'm playing. That maybe, maybe something not working out for a long time is actually, a good, is actually a good thing in the end. But it definitely does, like, suck when you're doing that for two years, right? Okay, so good. All right. Any other comments, insight? Please. Um, I think it's 
I know um, I've probably learned the most and failed the most at leadership and like just general leadership positions. Mm. Um, so I've learned a lot more about you know, having empathy towards my teammates and like understanding my expectations of them and how much work they should be putting in. Because I know when I'm in a leadership position or something, I'm usually really motivated and I'm really passionate about it. That's why I'm there. Mm. But I have to understand that not everyone, you know, the exact same about this kind of stuff, especially for like, I was in marching band, for instance. Yeah. Um, so you gotta be very was it, understanding of people. You have to understand how they learn, how they think. You have to, it's, and control your own emotions for me. Um, you know, it's, it's been a long process of learning of how to be a leader. Yeah, and even sometimes being a leader means that you have to show the example of failure, right? That I'm gonna fail for the team so that we all learn about failure and also so that I can make it a safe place for everyone else to experiment and make sure that they can participate. Yeah, great, great insights, thank you. Any others? Please. Uh, so I'm going into elementary education. Yeah. In a classroom, how can you help kids of that age deal with failure? That's a great question. What do you what have you already learned about that that you think is it, that you've that you've found helpful? Um, well from this session, you know, we can always take failures and turn them into wisdom. Hmm. I also have a younger brother who's ten years younger than me, so I've helped him through a few things. But with him, I feel like it's a little bit different. Right. Um, but I think just pointing out some of his success that they have had. Yeah. And maybe pointing them in the right direction of what they could do in the future if they start failing through more of a success. Mm. Yeah, that's good. That is good. Well, and, and um, so I think failure um, hurts the most when we are outcome focused. I really want to get that goal and I didn't. That hurt. I wanted to get that drawing completed then and it didn't happen. When we're really outcome focused and it doesn't work out, that's when I think failure burns the most. All right, we see that in sports all the time. Okay. <clears throat> in, uh, in my work with teams, and in my research with teams, I found that when you become process-oriented, failure, that's when, it, that's when it gets into its proper perspective as the gift that it is. So I think about little kids, right? I have them, I was one, sometimes I still feel like one, right? But you, you have these outcomes and it can be really important to get the A. It can be really important to do that well. And what we, what we forget as kids is maybe the, the gift of the process itself. So I'm not an actually early childhood expert, but my, my understanding is, and, and also kind of my belief and philosophy is that if we can focus on effort, if we can focus on process more than outcome at a young age, they, will, they, will, they won't have a fixed mindset about themselves where they start to say, well, I can only do some things and I can't do some, I can't do others because I'm just not good at math. Well, that's because you focused on the outcome. You're not thinking about the process. Math might be more challenging for you, might require a little more effort, but that doesn't mean it's impossible, right? So I think in, in a classroom environment with young children, focusing on the joy of process rather than on outcome uh, can, be, can be a blessing. And it can be helpful. I don't know. What do you What do you hear from that, or what do you What do you What are your insights from that? I think that it's a good idea to focus on more like the effects that maybe they did get right as opposed to the ones they got wrong. Mm -hmm. so I know for me, math is always my subject, and like I'm just not good at it. So that's why yeah. I think math is a struggle because um, I've always looked at the final grade rather than like the deadlines I've gotten right in the problem. So I can see how that be really good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah. So a great practice in, in an educational environment is to praise effort rather than to praise the outcome. Wow, you did that perfect and fast. Now I know that everything must be done fast and perfect. But what if I focus on the effort that went into that? Wow, I can really see that you put a lot of time and you really thought about this. Suddenly the child hears, you care about me thinking a lot about it and putting some time into something. It doesn't matter 
how beautiful it was, it was, or how perfect it was, it was that I really, you could see that I really put effort into it. And as we praise effort, I know with my own children, as I praise effort, they're a little more willing to do it again. Um, the one-year-old, she doesn't even speak English. So, but the four-year-old, if I praise her efforts, she will, she will do it again and again. Where if I praise her, her outcome, she gets a little more uh, uptight about it. She gets a little nervous about that. So it's, it's, not, it's not a perfect art. It, we're all, we sometimes fail even in, in giving the process focus. Okay, good, good thoughts, good insights. So we've talked about the womb, we've talked about babies, we've talked about walking. Now it's time to play. Okay, now there's all different ways in which we play. We experiment. We challenge ourselves or others. I di double dog dare you, right? We get super curious and explore and we ask tons of questions. My four-year-old is the queen of why. Why, dad? Why? Well, why? Well, why that? It's just like after, ten, after three whys, you're like basically explaining the universe. It's just, it's, there's a lot of curiosity in play. Imagine. We tell stories. Oh, even my 14-month-old little baby just loves looking at a book and the pictures and hearing the story, right? We love our stories. We share. We slow down. Oh, I loved sitting in the backyard and just watching the ants in the dirt. And then you'd bring out the hose and you see what happens with the hose, you know. Or you just look at, I just, I remember a lot just looking at the trees moving in the wind and watching and listening and slowing down. What a fun way to play. And then, of course, I'm a Lego fan. You got to build, you got to tear it down, you got to throw away the instructions, and you got to start over and just build again. Okay, all right, so this is where you have your piece of paper. You're going to watch a video of uh, some children playing. And while you watch this video, write down as many life skills, many or things, yeah, it's life skills like communication, okay? But as many life skills as you can see being represented in this, in this little video. There's, there's going to be lots. So just write down as many as you can, and we'll, we'll talk about it. So here we go. Children playing, write down as many life skills you see that they are practicing and developing while they play. Tweak it. 
Okay. All right. Well, life skills. Let's kind of share a bunch. What, what, what life skills were they? Did you see that they were developing and practicing while they play? Teamwork. Teamwork. Great. What else? Creativity. Oh, creativity and what? Listening. Listening. That's wonderful. Yeah. Others. Oh yeah, explaining and testing processes. Oh yeah, they're gonna do that their whole lives. Yeah. Planning. Planning. Yeah. Iterative design. Oh yeah, iterative design. Great. Others. Leadership. Leadership. Yeah. Please. Helping and asking for help. Ah, oh, good. I'm glad someone cut onto that. Did you hear her? Anyone know where this is? All right, asking for help. Boy, that's a skill. Ah, oh, that is a skill. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad you caught that. Any others? What else? Sorry, what? Learning. Oh, yeah, learning. Yeah, they're learning how to learn. Good. Anything else? Please. Oh, sorry. I pointed to both of you. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I guess not like uh, thinking that a not thinking that a project is finished just because it works, and you know, trying to see what else you can add onto it. Yeah. Oh, yo, oh, we'll we'll go back. Well, let's do that again. Yeah. Great. Uh, spatial awareness. Special spatial awareness. Oh yeah, yeah. I could use more of that. That's great. Okay, um, so tons of life skills, right? I mean, I don't even know how many we listed. I wasn't counting, but that's probably what? I don't know, 15? Okay, that was a ton just from playing. Um, so principle three, the last principle here. I, I firmly believe this, especially for children, but I also believe it for adults. Okay, good playing is good learning. And good learning is just good fun. It really is. If you're, if you're really engaged in learning, eh, it's fun. Because that's, that's how we grew up. That's how it is. In, in the wild, you go out, out there, right? And I, I've watched some BBC, Planet Earth, right? The baby lions have got to play. I mean, it's absolutely vital, critical to their survival to play. Uh, I think of that old Disney. I mean, it's older than me way older, but it's a Disney sing-along that says, you are a human animal. Okay, you are a human, anyway, I won't sing it for you. But the point is, I really, I, are we really that much different from lion cubs? I mean, how vital is it for us to play, for us to be able to, to learn about the world around us? Uh, my four-year-old, she processes We've had a lot of crazy things happen in our lives in the last four years, you know, and I watch her play and listen to her play, and she really processes and tries to understand the world while she plays. I mean, her baby elephant, I can't tell you how many times it has been to the hospital and gotten COVID and the flu, and we've had an ele a stuffed animal hospital around the house as she's trying to understand what it means to be in a pandemic. That's a four-year-old playing, trying to learn about what it is to be in a pandemic. So play is so important. And uh, I, I wish we had play involved way more in college, right? Um, and in our, in our <laughs> particularly, I'd love it in my PhD program. But uh, I, have to bring, I have to be the one to bring the play. OK, so we'll do a quick check-in about play. Anyone have questions, comments? Things just percolating that you want to share about play. Please. Oh, like when I think about play, oftentimes I think about not being necessarily productive and working towards something. So, hmm. like, say um, you want to teach someone how to write a research paper. Sure. You know, how do you incorporate play into that to make it make that also more fun to learn about? Hmm. Good. Okay. So you want to reuse the research paper example? Just as an example. Yeah. As an example. What, what would you, what comes to mind? Based off of what we talked about, what would you suggest? Let's see. It's hard for me, it's hard for me to imagine because it's like more of an upper level skill for like um, high school. But just imagine like going through like the different parts and maybe you can make it a little bit more fun and interactive. Yeah, as a teacher you could. Sure. So like go through like different research um, articles and whatnot. Or you could like uh, just go through the actual like creating idea and, make, and try to make it fun that way. It's hard for me to imagine them making it like a game or something like that. It's a little bit hard. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, I'll tell you what. Writing a research paper is a lot like being like Indiana Jones. <laughs> You've got to go to the archives. 
you've got to go down some crazy tunnels and use some keywords and you got to go to the library and it feels a little bit like you're walking down a tunnel waiting to get to the gold head you know before someone checks out the book you need and or whatever right so you know putting it in that context right i don't know there's lots of ways you could do it uh, analogies and metaphors work wonderful right telling stories or even writing a research paper on a totally ridiculous thing while also learning the rules about the research paper while writing it about, I don't know, you could. I got really excited about writing about the history of crosswalks. And one of my advisors was like, I need you to write about crosswalks. And I was like, okay, why? Anyway, I got so stinking excited about writing about crosswalks. The history of crosswalks is, could be like a Netflix series. It's filled with murder and romance. I mean, it's exciting. The Beatles, right, play a huge part in crosswalk history, okay? How would you know that unless you just jump, jump right in? I mean, it's absolutely, I mean, I'm just, I'm obsessed with crosswalks now. But I, I didn't know. So making play, I don't know, making a research paper fun, it can be the topic, it can be the way you present it. I've gone to an elementary school classroom to teach coding, and I dressed up, we did Star Wars. I mean, it was like putting on a whole Broadway production. I mean, we had Yoda there, I mean, the whole thing. But we were coding to save the, you know, the reliance from the Death Star, you know, the whatever. And uh, it was awesome, right? I mean, coding, coding can be miserable, right? I've been in the classroom, like HTML, you know, you're plugging it in, don't forget the comma and the semicolon, and you're just like, oh, I could die. You know, it's just so hard. But imagine if I was trying to save my planet you know, from the Death Star. Oh, so cool. Um, so I don't know. There's ways to make, bring a little bit of fun into everything. And now you're all going to go research the history of crosswalks. Mission accomplished. Okay. All right. Principle. These are the three principles we talked about how people learn. Now, these are, there are more ways in which people learn. But, I mean, for example, to your point, I've just taught you how people learn, and I haven't brought up a single academic article. But everything here... I mean, this could be a whole literature review, right? But we've tried to make it fun. I don't know. You can tell me later. But like, that was horrible. This whole failure thing. Anyway, so, but these are the principles. You've got sensory experience. You, as you aggregate information, as you assimilate information, it comes through your senses. You can capitalize on that. Re failure comes through, you have fail, reflect, adapt, boom, we have wisdom. And we could plug that into a learning experience where we actually intentionally want our students to fail at something so they can learn. The capacitor syndrome, right? Not syndrome, sorry, the capacitor explosion. He built failure in. He's a genius, right? And then principle, learn through play. And play as you learn. Make it fun. I'm having to do that with one of my classes right now. It's not fun, but we're learning how to play. Um, this question, I'll let, since we're running out of time, I'll let you think about that. But I want to share one more thing about Johann Pestalozzi. Here's the, here's, this is my citation. Okay. So here's Johann Pestalozzi. He's a Swedish f educational philosopher, uh, and I love him. He is so cool. Uh, and I love that he's got some sweet hair. I mean, his, his mid-18th century hair is just rocking. Okay? So I love Johann. Now, <clears throat> Johann believed and put forth his educational philosophy that if we are to educate, we are to inspire and engage the head, the heart, and the hands of every learner. So think about that as you are designing experiences for people that you're trying to teach. But maybe even if you're not doing that, think about your own learning experience here at Purdue. How have you engaged your head and your heart and your hands? Johan did a great job. He spent his life trying to help poor children come to school. They would learn about how to make things, and the things they made they would sell, and that, stuff, and that money was used to go and feed their families for the next day. It was a pretty cool pretty cool uh, educational philosopher. He, doesn't have to, he, he wanted to engage their head in understanding math. He wanted to engage their hands by making something in their heart, by serving someone else in their community, and 
and, uh, and having them be able to serve their families. So it is my invitation for you that in your education, seek to engage your head, your heart, and your hands. How can you bring all of these together as you learn here at Purdue?